this week. Two strikes in the West and a strike against slavery in the East. The loss at Thompson Station has been painful for the Union. The center of a full brigade due to a failed reconnaissance mission. Shameful. Well, it hasn't stopped reconnaissance missions. Colonel Albert S. Hull of the Union has a brigade. Seriously. A brigade. Just like at Thompson Station. But don't worry, it has even less men. 1,300. How does reconnaissance, leaving Murphys Bureau on the 18th, moving northeast, passing Milton, with an addition of 3,500 cavalry under John Hunt Morgan, a major general of the Confederacy, appears on the horizon. The sudden appearance of Morgan causes Hall to fall back towards Milton near Vaught's Hill, being harassed all the way by the rebels. It's midday on the 20th as Morgan finally catches up with Hall. Hall has the hill, and his men form a battle line, but are soon encircled by the numerically superior enemy. Morgan's men dismount and strike on Hall's flanks, forcing him to form a circle of battle, leaving nothing to be exploited, but stretching the line dangerously thin. Hall runs around his perimeter defense, this being the name for the circular defense he has taken up. For hours, the horsemen of the saddle charge up the hill, but concentrated musket fire sends them back down. The smoke chokes the high ground, clinging to the earth, forcing each side to fire and pray their ball finds the enemy. The losses for both sides are hard, but the number is not anywhere close to being equal. Morgan falls back and spends another 150 minutes bombarding Hall, but to no great success. Morgan breaks off the engagement, having lost 373 men, only inflicting 62 casualties onto Hall. It's a Union victory, securing not only the battlefield itself, but a stronger hold over Middle Tennessee, because Morgan only broke off the engagement because of Union reinforcements from Murphy's Bureau. Which brings us to another battle. While the Union holds onto the territory, the Confederates still hold onto the cavalry advantage. One of the most valuable assets in the area is the Nashville and Decatur Railroad. One of the strategic supply depots that goes along this railroad is in the small town of Brentwood. Holding Brentwood is Lieutenant Colonel Edward Bloodgood, oh I like that name, of the Union. Stationed with him are 500 or so men at Brentwood itself and 200 further away guarding a bridge over the Little Harpeth River. These 200 men do a pretty poor job because after Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest sends out a brigade under Colonel James W. Storms to raid the railroad tracks, he crosses the river with the brigade of General Franks Armstrong and attacks the depot. He circles and bombards Bloodgood, forcing the surrender of the 500 men. Forrest rides south and captures a stockade under a captain, along with 300 or so men. With supply wagons and anywhere from 500 to 800 prisoners, words vary, he marches back and crosses the Harpeth River, burning the bridge that was once guarded by those 200 or so useless men. And the last thing on this week, on the last day of this week, the last vestige of slavery in West Virginia is stamped on. Kind of, not really. The creation of the state of West Virginia requires the gradual abolition of slavery at least. In order to ensure that this happens, an amendment must be added to the state constitution. The amendment is the Wiley Amendment, named after West Virginian, currently Virginian, Senator Waitman T. Wiley. The Wiley Amendment. The children of slaves born within the limits of the state after the 4th day of July, 1863, shall be free, and all slaves within the state, who shall at the time after said, be under the age of 10 years, shall be free when they arrive at the age of 21 years, and all slaves over 10 and under 21 years shall be free when they arrive at the age of 25 years, and no slave shall be permitted to come into the state for permanent residence therein. The first slaves freed under this amendment would be in 1867, with no inclusion of slaves older than 21. Apparently they would die as enslaved individuals. And the Emancipation Proclamation exempted this area, so it was at the mercy of the soon-to-be state for the over 18,000 individuals living within its borders. Just to point out how rushed this is, those born from June 20th to July 4th of this year will be born into slavery. It'll go for a public vote on the 20th of April. 
It's likely to pass, but Jesus. This isn't what the Republicans wanted when they required emancipation from the prospective state. Then there are sickles. News comes of a visit by the Lincolns in early April. While it is to check in on Hooker, Sickles is a friend and ally to the White House family and will play the role of Maitre de Placiers. Who am I getting an American? Maitre de Placiers, or Master of Ceremonies. He plans an infantry review, a parade, and a meeting of the noble women of the camp. What will be done in the first two weeks of April? That's where the week ends, with successful and unsuccessful defenses against Confederate cavalry in the West. But raids are able to be dealt with. The Battle of Brentwood isn't the same scale as Bots Hill, but it's another Union week. We are seeing the limits of the South in the saddle. So far, the CSA horsemen have been unbeaten in the field, except for Kelly's Ford. And as the campaigning season arrives, the failure of the capture means the Union will be more prepared to defeat the Confederate Army. Hello, it's the entire Civil Week by Week team here. These are trying times of our lives. I'm sure everyone who's watching has heard about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I just want everyone to know that I plan on donating my two months, March and April, to a Ukrainian charity to help support the civilians during this trying time. I'd like to thank every single one of my patrons, allowing me to make even a small difference. I hope everyone stays safe during these, again, trying times. Thank you, and I will see you next week.